Here we go. Welcome uh, to Monday. No, it's not Monday. It's Thursday <laughs> night. Uh, I have to think about what day it is. This is uh, Curtis Brown, and we are talking about trig identities. I'm joined again by uh, Steve Kakoska and Tom Dick and Vicki Carter this evening. I'm very excited uh, to have them joining us uh this evening steve i know you guys have worked hard on getting us some uh great questions and uh prompts to be looking at so very excited to see that uh this evening and uh it's students i know that i've already seen several students here uh at uh on the uh the chat so please feel free uh to ask your questions in the chat i'm monitoring that and i'll make sure that these guys get a chance to answer your questions also, teachers, uh, really excited to have you guys uh, joining us here this evening. If your students are asking questions, that's fantastic. Uh, you can weigh in on those things as well. Uh, this is a community thing. We're trying to do, uh, you know, what's best for everybody and, and help students along, help teachers along with the content uh, and sharing some ideas of how to teach it and some of the questions you can ask. And so uh, the questions that Steve and, and Tom and, and Vicki write, uh, please feel free to share those with your students and utilize them in this webinar, this session, uh, as a great place to review. So uh, happy to have you. And Steve, I'm going to let you take it away so I quit talking. All right. Could you allow me to share my screen? Oh, you know, these uh, permissions hey. things. I, I, you know, I know you're always want that uh, that picky, stuff picky, here. So. I, know. I, know. I, might, I might also uh, add that if teachers and or students have specific questions, they should feel free to send them to you and we'll take a look at them during one of these sessions. Absolutely. We'd We've got students that. on from Georgia and teachers from Florida ready to go. Terrific. All right, well, we're gonna start out with a couple of questions here that deal with some trig equations and trig inequalities. I'm gonna try one of them, solving it sort of what I call analytically, Curtis, and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Tom to do a little bit of technology. And, and Vicky has some great suggestions for solving some of these by looking at unit circles. And I confess to you that that's actually the way that I kind of solve these mentally. Sometimes I have to draw a picture. I've drawn a couple on the right-hand side, and I'll talk about those. So here we go. Don't let me make a mistake on any of these, Curtis. Here's the first one. We want to see if we can find all the values of x that satisfy this equation. I think that says the square root of 2 cosine of 4x plus 1. So the first thing I thought about when I read this question is, well, this says all the values of x, so there are no restrictions on x. So I've got to think about that in the background as I solve this problem. So one of the first things I'm trying to do here is to isolate a trig function with an argument on one side of the equation and a numeric value on the other. And so what I did is I brought this one to the other side, to the right-hand side, by subtracting one from both sides. And then I divided by the square root of two. So I've got a minus one over the square root of two. Now, what I did is I made one more step, and this is just sort of my preference. This goes back to the way that I sort of learned uh, trigonometry. And so I rationalized that to get minus the square root of two over two. Again, that's just for me. You don't have to do that, but that's the way I remember this. That's the way I remember my common angles. So, all right, I think about where does that occur in a unit circle? So that's why I sort of drew this picture to myself. What does the argument have to be? What does the common angle have to be? So that the cosine is minus square root of two over two. And that actually occurs in two places over here in the second and the third quadrant at three pi over four and in this angle, five pi over four. So in order to solve this problem, I have to take the argument of the cosine, in this case, 4x, set that equal to 3 pi over 4, one of those common angles, but then add 2n pi, because this occurs every cycle around, every trip around that unit circle. And I'm thinking of n as an integer plus or minus, OK? The other place this can happen is at 5 pi over 4, and again, plus 2n pi. So in order to solve for x, what I need to do is to isolate that all alone on the left-hand side. I need to divide everything by 4 and see if I've done this correct. I get a 3 pi over 16 plus n pi over 2. I think that works. One of the 2s cancel, and I'm left with a 2 in the denominator. 
and over here are 5 pi over 16 plus n pi over 2. So there are sort of two separate answers here. Um, I didn't put an or in the middle, but maybe I should have to make this complete and, and completely correct. So let's modify this just a little bit in part B so that we can deal with an inequality. Let me see if I've got this working here. Hey, how about that? Let's see if we can find all the values of x in this interval. So now I'm restricting the values of x. I only want x in that interval, 0 to pi, that satisfy this equation strictly less than 0. OK, I'm going to start out in sort of the same way here. Let's see, I'm going to bring the minus 1. I'll bring the 1 to the right-hand side. So there's a minus 1, divide by the square root of 2. And I'm left with this equation, cosine of 4x is less than minus square root of 2 over 2. So we're going to think a little bit about where that happens here on my unit circle. And as I do that, I want to make sure that I capture all these possibilities so that x will be between 0 and pi. So let's see. I have cosine of 3 pi over 4, cosine of 5 pi over 4. Both of those are minus the square root of 2 over 2. And actually, angles in here produce a value that are less than the square root of 2 over 2. And that's kind of odd to think about. They actually produce values that are greater negative, but therefore less than the square root of 2 over 2. So one place this can happen, I think this is the easiest, the easier one, is 4x, that argument of the cosine, must be between 3 pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4. But I can't stop there. I've got to think a little bit more about this. I've got to take this 3 pi over 4 and add 2 pi, take the 5 pi over 4 and add 2 pi to get these two values, solve for x, and see if those values are actually less than, or pardon me, between 0 and pi. And indeed, they are. So there are actually two intervals on which this occurs, two intervals that satisfy this equation. 3 pi over 16, less than x, less than 5 pi over 16, and the other one on the right-hand side there, 11 pi over 16, less than x, less than 13 pi over 16. And Curtis, you know me, I'm not satisfied with just that analytics all the time. I like to take a look at a graph. And so what I did is I drew a graph of this equation, square root of 2, cosine of 4x plus 1. And I eyeballed this. I took a look and tried to figure out, well, where is that less than 0? Mm. So between here and here, here and here. And although I don't have tick marks there, it does seem reasonable that these two values are 3 pi over 16 and 5 pi over 16. If you look at my graph, if you look at the scale, right. those seem very reasonable. And right. similar, similarly over here, 11 pi over 16 and 13 pi over 16. So I feel pretty good about that in, in addition on this graph. I don't see any other places, any other intervals where this graph is below the x-axis. So I think I found all the x values in that interval 0 to pi. I feel pretty confident about this solution. All right. So, Steve, let's let's put a little thinking to the um, group that we have on tonight. So you asked for the solutions only between 0 and pi. How many more intervals would we get thinking about the periodic nature of this function? And now that you've got the graph in front of you, what if we had asked from zero to two pi? How many just we don't have to come up with the intervals, but how many would we have? So if we have two in the interval from zero to pi, think about it being periodic. How many more would we get? Well, we'll ask Curtis to monitor the chat. <laughs> I'm watching the chat. Um, we could ask I, him for an answer. Vicky. You could ask me for an. You could ask me for an answer. I have. I have an answer. I'm gonna wait and watch the chat just to make sure. But um, while we're watching the chat to see if anybody answers Vicky quest Vicky's question about zero to two pi, how many more would we expect? And 
uh, could we expect a quick way to be able to reference those? I think that's a good uh, thought process. There was a chat or a question from uh, Stephanie Frey in, I think she was said she was from Georgia, um, was asking about if College Board was planning, if you have any opinion on whether College Board was planning to always use inequalities to be able to describe those intervals, or would we see other interval notation uh, as a part of um, prompts, question prompts, and that sort of thing? Um, by the College Board. I know in calculus, we may see those things, but in pre-cal, are we expecting that they will? That's a really good question. In calculus, of course, if the, the student can generally return this type of inequality or using interval notation. I'm going to assume, and Vicki will, uh, will have to respond to this, I'm going to assume that in AP pre-calc, they would allow both also, okay? There's a problem, I think, with this one in, in the following sense, Curtis. Let me just take a look at, at this interval. You know, in using interval notation, three pi over 16 to five pi over 16, common mathematical notation would dictate that those have to be parentheses to indicate open intervals. And they'd have to be open intervals because of this inequality up here. Right. In AP calculus, in AP calculus, generally we don't see questions on the free response portion of the exam where those open or closed intervals are an issue. I mean, except domain issues, except infinity or minus infinity. So I don't know, Vicki, if you have an answer to that one, I don't know how they're going to deal with that. We haven't seen a test yet, a real live test yet. I would hope they would accept both kinds of notation, but Vicki, what do you think? Um, I th I, we've got the one, we've got the samples in the CED. We've got the one release practice exam one. We're going to get two more practice exams. I was trying to flip back and pull my cord out <laughs> from my mic. <laughs> Oh, no, that's all right. I was looking back at the ex the the release exam. Well, the release practice exam that we had. I'm yeah. thinking it is uh, the inequality, the compound inequality notation that we've seen. I think that's probably what we will see, but I can't speak definitively on that. Um, my my best suggestion to everybody that asks questions that are really good like this is keep looking at the practice exams when they're released to see what kind of format answers are being, um, you know, what we're saying the answers should be. These are probably going to be more in a multiple choice question than in a free right, response please. question. Uh, Vicki, one more question about Part B before we hand it over to Tom. I know, Curtis, that you're monitoring the chat. Uh, Vicki asked a question about uh, this function being periodic. Is there a way to look at this function, this one right here, and to determine the period? I mean, we can kind of see what's going on graphically. Uh, but is there a way to kind of look at that function and tell what the period is? And absolutely. And students need to be able to do that. So that is actually a very um, important uh, part of topic 3.1, where we just introduce periodic functions and looking at a graph, and it doesn't even have to be sinusoidal. Uh, we've got some real, Tom, you did a real good presentation a few weeks ago about how to produce these other piecewise functions that are periodic, so they can look at them and say, oh, I can tell that the period is four, the period is two, and in this case, the period would be pi over two. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, Tom, shall I turn it over to you for a little technology? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we never got, while we were turning it over to uh, <laughs> Tom there, I did not get, uh, I did not get a response from any of the students in the chat. The teachers also didn't, uh, didn't put any response in the chat. So I'm going to have to stick my neck out there and say that I think there are two more intervals uh, along with the initial two that we saw there. <laughs> uh that would also meet that uh meet that criteria of being less than uh less than zero very good well, I, curtis <laughs> i think you went to the grand prize curtis which is a mocha latte at the very first starbucks ever in seattle all right okay <laughs> tom what do you got i'm gonna hold you to that steve <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, so I was just going to make some notes with folks about uh, using your graphing calculator on problems like these and 
Steve, you ended up with looking at a graph, which is, of course, one of the main things you could do with a graph and calculator. Um, I'm just going to take a quick look at a zoom decimal window. And it's a blank graph. I haven't tried anything yet, but I just want to take a look at what the window settings look like for that. And I just want to draw people's attention down here to the bottom. It's the reason I like zoom decimal windows for lots of functions is the trace step is really nice. Plus the window is squared up in the sense that a pixel's worth the same amount in both directions. But that trace step's really nice for a lot of functions because we know we're going 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on. We're going to hit the integers. Very nice. But for trigonometric functions, the, the nice values are actually certain multiples of pi. And so there is a, a zoom window that's kind of special for that. So I went back to the zoom menu. And if you look down there at number seven, it says Z trig. So I want to go down to that and hit enter. And, you know, it's another blank screen and it looks <laughs> pretty similar to what we had before, though it looks like maybe that's uh, space slightly different. But the main thing I want to look at is let's look at the window. And the X min and X max, those numbers might not seem particularly interesting, but if you look at the X scale, that number might look familiar. 1.57. I don't know. That sounds suspiciously like plus change. Uh, that's a <laughs> pi over two. So my uh, tick marks along my axis, the X axis, are actually at multiples of pi over two. And if you look at the very bottom, you see that trace step. There's another weird looking value, <laughs> 1308. Let me just quit off there. And I'm going to do a quick calculation of pi divided by 24. Aha, deja vu, that's that same value. So what they've done is they've made the trace values pi over 24. And if you think about your fractions a little bit, that's going to get your pi over 6, your pi over 4, your pi over 3 multiples really nicely. So kind of an optimal window. Uh, for trig functions. Of course, you know, as you play with trig functions and you uh, monkey around with the amplitude and period, you know, you, you could throw that out of whack, certainly. Uh, but for a lot of standard trig functions, that's going to be a, a nice window to look at. So one of the things Steve did is he just went to his uh, function plotter and plotted a nice graph. And I'm just going to go ahead and do that here on the uh, 84. Let's see, we had a... Uh, I think it was square root of two times the cosine of four X. Right. And then close that off and then a plus one. And let's just go ahead and graph that. I already have a zoom trig window there. We're actually getting quite a few more periods or cycles, I should say of this function than uh, what Steve had. But you can see graphical analysis, we're looking for zeros. Uh, we could actually use the calculate um, menu here. All right, see, so we want to calculate a zero. And then it's going to want us to actually kind of trap that between a couple of values. So. Let's see, we were interested between zero and pi, or actually you were interested in all of them, I guess, for part A, but we That's were correct. going to get a particular one. Let me just get this first one left down. So I'm to the left of it. I just want to scroll over enough or trace over enough to get to the other side of it. Hit enter for a right bound. And I guess I just need to get something close to the actual value. My bounds are so close to each other, I'm just going to hit enter again. I do that pretty often. And I'm getting this value, 0 0.589. Uh, it's a decimal value. Let's see, I think uh, Steve's first value was 3 pi over 16. So I'm going to go back to the calculator uh, screen and just try 3 pi divided by 16. 
do a little bit of a reality check here. Ah, it's looking it's good. good. So, very good. Now, um, now, we would get a, a, you saw how the zoom trig graph did that, uh, those nice values. You can kind of like certainly do that by hand. Since on part B, we were interested in from zero to pi, I might want to just go ahead and set my X min and X max to zero and pi respectively. And my X scale, let's see, well, uh, I was seeing those pi over 16s. What, what if I actually made my tick marks every pi over 16? Well, we can do that by just entering it that way. As soon as we hit enter, it calculates out the, you know, the decimal approximation it can for that. Uh, so now we have, um, and you know, something I'm not sure is, I don't know if I can change the... Uh, you can absolutely depth. change the trace depth. <laughs> so maybe uh, I'll make that uh, pi over 64 or something like that. Well, if you do, uh, so this is this is good. I'm I'm glad you're trying this uh, live as you do that. When you say that to set that to pi over sixty four, what it's going to do is it's going to go back up and adjust um, your x scale uh, in order uh. to make that in order to make that trace step work. So if you hit enter right now, you're going to see it shrink that from uh, zero to uh, zero to to pi. Um, you're going to see that shrink just a little bit, I think. Uh, so hit enter. No, expand. Sorry, wrong direction. It was already smaller than pi over 64. Um, but now it's it's scaled such that you still start at zero. But now your trace step is really going to be pi over 64. Right. Um, but I know it changed the X max just slightly. So it now it changed that X max than... to increase the number of uh, pixels, basically, that you have that are graphed there. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, I take that back. It actually changed my X max quite a bit. This is a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it more than doubled it. I had something at pi before. Okay. Yeah, yeah. it more than doubled it. Live with that. Okay. So, and so now cool. if I graph this again, is this? But you. You can see it's crossing at some nice values because these tick marks are multiples of, let's see, the third one over, that'd be 3 pi over 16, the 5 pi over 16. Yep. And you can see that repeating nature. There was one other thing I wanted to show people that I, you know, I'm not sure people are aware of. And it's, it's kind of a very interesting way to use the function plotter. And in part B of this first problem here, we actually had an inequality. It was the square root of two times cosine of four X plus one. And we were interested in when was that left less than zero? Yep. Now, it may seem really strange, but I can actually put into my Y1 here that inequality. So I've got the, the, the function expression there. So I'm going to go to the test menu. That's where my inequality symbols are. And down there on number five is the less than. And then I'll put zero. Now, this just looks bizarre. It looks y1 <laughs> equals and, and the expression is less than zero. But what I want you to think of is that inequality is something that you take on one of two values. It's either true when you plug in a value of x, or it's false when you plug in a value of x. And what it does is if I plot this, it's going to plot the number 1 as a y value when it's true. It'll plot the number 0 when it's false. Well, let's take a look at what that looks like. Wow. All right, so remember these little tick marks on the x-axis, we've got those calibrated to be pi over 16. So when I get to 3 pi over 16, notice it was 0 up until I got to that value. And then between 3 pi over 16 and 5 pi over 16, I'm getting the value 1, which says, okay, that, that inequality is true. Now I have to wait till I get, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, oh, 11, sounds familiar, 11 pi over 16, the 13 pi over 16, it's true again. And 
Now, I'm not suggesting that this is the way you, you really want to go through the analysis, but it, this is, I think, a nice way to uh, do a confirmatory check on your work. And, uh, and it also kind of the same this periodicity of these solutions in, in kind of a, a different and but neat way. So, and this is a really quite robust thing. I mean, you can have um, inequality, but we might try it again on a later problem Steve shows us. Where okay. You have two functions on either side of the inequality sign. It can still, still handle. All right. So this I'm going is really, that's really, really cool. We actually had a comment in the chat about uh, doing that looks kind of illegal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's brilliant. Uh, I think that's a really cool way to utilize that Boolean operator of inequality um, to be able to tell, you know, when something is, uh, is true or false. And, and in the case, what Steve was trying to talk about here of, Finding solutions between zero and two or zero and pi, um, where that function returns a value less than zero, that's a great way to kind of confirm. Yeah, my solutions make some sense uh, that I got from that analytical um, that analytical piece. I also really liked um, checking out the um, the uh, the using the zeros and calculating those zeros i think that's a a great strategy uh for confirming that hey the work that i did analytically uh is making sense uh graphically and numerically uh, in both cases we did get one question from a student that asked if um th if the answer that we would get maybe if we expanded this or at least i think and nina you can tell me if i'm asking this wrong but it says is the answer of this going to be two different x plus pk equations. Uh, and I I think that's exactly right, right? Like we're, we're gonna have some little boundary and then uh, another little boundary, we're gonna be able to do that periodically um, with some sort of constant uh, for each one of those, right? Some sort of constant for the times pi, that's correct. Or right, two times pi. pi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pi. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Now that would be if you were doing the uh, what are all values correct? Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That way, some way you'd have to enter, get the period worked into that. Uh, you'd have to get the period worked in, and then because of the way Steve asked the question, uh, it it repeats um, once every uh, half period, right? right. right. Uh, because this one had the convenient uh, nature of having that zero to two pi um uh full period so that was kind of cool tom i have one more question before you leave this page uh i'm probably remembering this wrong but is there a way uh to have the calculator display uh the endpoints of the axes here um can you can you somehow indicate on this on the screen what those tick marks are, or at least one of them, like it starts at zero and it goes to, you know, two pi or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Is there any way to do that on the 84? You know, I'm not sure there is. I mean, when I want to get the extreme values, I tend to just do a quick hit my window. Yes. And look at them. They're listed right there. So my X min, my X max, so that's the far left and far right. Okay. Y min and Y max are... Are there so I, and then I could go immediately back to the graph back and okay. forth. But you're okay. you're talking about actually having those labels appear. Yeah, there's no no way yeah. to label that in the yeah, on the PI Inspire we can, we can. We can do that. Yeah. But on the Inspire we can we can't on the eighty four. Okay, but checking. I think but I think that's really important for why you would want to. Uh, so we're confirming our analytic solution that we came up with. But yep. to notice that pi over 16, multiples of pi over 16 in those answers that we had, and to realize that it's important to set that um, X scale to that pi over 16 so that it is easy to count one pi over 16, two pi over 16 to reach that point that you understand this graph is confirming what we did. Okay. okay. Thanks, Tom. All right. I'll do a stop share and turn it back over to you, Steve. All righty. Here we go. Let's try the second one. I hope Curtis is ready for this one. Oh, man. Right. Uh, 2A is similar to 1A, but let's take a look at this one. Let's see if we can find all the values of x that satisfy this particular trigonometric equation set equal to zero. 
And so I started out by doing the same sort of thing. I brought this minus one half over here to the right-hand side. I multiplied both sides by the square root of three, and I have this expression. So I have the sine of an argument equal to a numerical or a value, an analytical value. And I'm going to think a little bit about my unit circle here. Remember, this is find all value. So I'm going to think a little bit about my unit circle. And honest to goodness, Vicki, this is the way I used to do them. Where is the argument? What argument do I need on that unit circle to get a square root of 3 over 2 for the sun? Let's see. I think there's one there and there's one there. There's a pi over 3 and a 2 pi over 3. So I do something similar as I did in the first problem. I take that argument. I set that equal to pi over 3 plus 2n pi, where n is, okay, 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2 all the way down the line. Same thing over here. The argument is 2 pi over 3 plus 2n pi. And I solve for x in this case by dividing both sides by 2. There are my two answers. So similar to the one we did in 1a, have to think about this. I have to think a little bit about this unit circle again to come up with these two equations. B is a little trickier. Let me see if I can arrow up a little bit, see if I've got that working tonight. Hey, how about that? So now we want to find all the values of x in this interval. We're restricting the interval once again between 0 and 2 pi that satisfy this equation. This one's a little bit different. We've got two trig functions in here. No quote-unquote constant, like a minus 1, like a square root of 2 over 2 or anything like that. I suspect that there are several different ways to solve this one. I'm going to show you how I dis did this one. Uh, Curtis, I, I think I have a question for you in here. Um, let's see what happens. The very first thing I tried was to use a trig identity to rewrite the left-hand side. So I know the sine of a double angle. Sine of 2x is 2 sine cosine. And then what I did is I brought the cosine of x to the other side so that I have this expression. So my question for you, Curtis, is, you know, uh, someone who doesn't watch Thursday night pre-calculus would look at that expression and say, well, jeepers, I'll just divide both sides by the cosine of x. <laughs> and I'll get 2 sine less than or equal to, well, 1. I wonder why you can't do that. I mean, it sort of makes sense. I have a common factor of cosine on both sides. I wonder why you can't do that. Not hearing an answer from you immediately, Curtis. It, does, we'll leave, we'll it leave does make sense. Chat. It does make um, sense. It, it does it make sense like to do this, but I think thing. wasn't part of this thing where we worried about uh, cosine being equal to zero? Cosine well, of x being equal to zero? Certainly an issue. That is one particular issue. I think there are others here, but that's certainly a problem because there are values of X, which would so, produce a cosine of zero. Yeah, we don't, we we don't want to have that. We don't want that. <laughs> I will <laughs> leave that the question for the chat, Curtis. Why can't I'm you? I'm going to leave that one to the chat. Okay. Okay. I'm so going to do everything for people watching this session. People need to interact <laughs> on the chat a little bit. There you go. There you go. Well, they're vying for this prize for tonight. So let's see. I'm going to factor out a cosine of e out of each one of those terms. And now I've got a product. I've got this product less than or equal to zero. Now, there's a couple of things that I can do here. I think the way that I attack this one is, well, I'm first going to figure out where is that product equal to zero? Because I know that's going to divide my interval up here into subintervals that I need to look at. So how do you make a product zero? The only way to do that is if one of the factors is zero. Uh, thinking back and using perhaps, I hope, the right terminology here, that's the principle of zero products. So let's see, where's the cosine of x zero in this interval? Well, that would be at x equal pi over two and three pi over two. Where's the sine of x equal to one half? Where did that come from? Well, that's the second factor. 2 sine of x minus 1 equal to 0. That gives me a sine of x equal to 1 half. That occurs at pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. Well, Tom certainly knows this much more than Vicky, but she also knows this. I'm a big proponent of sine charts. 
I, I like them for analyzing, especially this type of problem. You may have a better way to do this, but here's how I'm going to attack this. I'm going to draw so Steve, two. Steve, uh, pause just a second. And I, and I yeah. am going to bring up a comment that someone mentioned earlier. We do inequalities in units one, unit two, and unit three. And that consistency of using a sign chart when you see an inequality is probably very valuable to students. So that that is a strong reason for continuing to do sign charts. Good. Okay. Thanks. I agree with that. Okay, here we go. This is a sign chart for the very first factor, cosine of x. It might be kind of hard to see on my screen, but I have some solid square brackets there. Um, here's my weird reasoning for that. I'm looking between 0 and 2 pi inclusive. So I have some square brackets there. I want to make sure you can see those. Um, in the interest of saving just a little bit of time, I know that at pi over 2, the cosine is 0. At 3 pi over 2, the cosine is 0. And I check the sign. I can think about my unit circle if you want there. I can think about just the graph of the cosine of x in this case. And I know that it's positive over here in this interval, negative in this interval, and positive in that interval. We know, we know just as an aside, it cannot change sign in any other place in that interval. For 2 times the sign of uh, x minus 1. All right, here's my sign chart for that. And actually, I cheated just a little bit here. And what I did is I took a look at, let's see, I took a look at this expression right here. And I took a look at the sine of x equal to 1 half. And I took a look, where is that? Where is the sine less than 1 half? Where is the sine greater than 1 half? To make it a little bit easier for me. We know that this is zero right here at pi over six and five pi over six. And again, I got a minus sign there, a plus sign there, and a minus sign there. Here's what I did to try to put all of this together. I've got these two sign charts lined up. They kind of divide this interval zero to two pi up into lots of sub intervals. In order to make this product less than or equal to zero, one of those has to be, okay, positive. One has to be negative in order to make it strictly less than zero. So, okay, my chart's going to get a little messy, but hopefully I can figure this out. Let's see, between zero and pi over six, one of the factors is negative. The other is positive. The product is negative. Therefore, that's an interval that is a solution to this equation and therefore a solution to my origin. The next interval here is pi over six to pi over two. Well, in that case, both of them are positive. So that's thrown out. Between pi over two and five pi over six, well, I have positive here, negative here. Ah, the product is negative. So that interval is included in my solution. And let's see, the next interval is a little bit bigger, 5 pi over 6 to 3 pi over 6. They're both negative. Both factors are negative. Product is therefore positive. And in this last interval, one's positive, one's negative. And son of a gun, after all of that analysis, which at least for me, I can see on this sign chart, I have three intervals, three intervals for x, so that that equation is satisfied. And you know me, Curtis, i got to take a look at this graphically. I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but there are some nice colors in here. Here's what I tried to graph. I've got a graph of y equal to sine of 2x. I've got a graph of the cosine of x. And then I've got a graph of that difference. And so what I really want to know is where is that difference? Where is this graph less than 0? Let's see. I think I can see that. Right in here, 0 to pi over 6. Let's see. Right in here, pi over 2 to 5 pi over 6. And is there another one? Yeah, right here. 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. So I'm feeling pretty good about my solution. I think my analytic solution, my sign chart analysis worked. I think I found all three of those intervals. So, Steve, this is, yeah. uh, you know, this is really a nice visual for the importance uh, 
you know, it really shows the importance of those uh, of those sign charts just for making sense of what we're trying to do. And I know Tom probably is thinking ahead already about how, you know, putting these on the on the graphing calculator, making that same graph of what you've got there to confirm it. Uh, but I think that is really a nice, just a nice way as a Let's student to be able to pay attention to that. Um, Tom, should uh, are you going to do any technology here, or should I continue with three? Um, yeah, if I could, Steve, I might just okay. do a really. Uh, okay, very good. Sure. Okay. Um, hopefully, you're seeing my screen here, and uh, what I thought I'd do is just. Uh, kind of leverage right off what you just did, Steve, and then bring back that uh, inequality idea. Uh, I'm going to go to the Y equals menu and put in the two functions that you're dealing with on that last part, which was the sine of 2x. And I think it was just cosine x. Um, and, but on Y3, what I'm going to do is actually do enter the inequality, sine of 2x. So and you're going to use that Boolean operator against uh, yeah. Tom? Yep, exactly. I think this one was less than or equal. So I'll go down to the number 6, cosine x. Tom, if you had wanted to, can you use the uh, calculator variables y1 and y2 there? I believe so. Yeah, I could sure. do y1 less than or equal to y2. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> could have done yeah. that. Okay. I kind of deliberately chose not to just so, you know, we could see the entire inequality there like that. Yep. And I'm, again, going to make use of the uh, Zoom Um trig window because I think that's got the nicer values. And so there's my sine of 2x, there's my cosine x. And now this is that weird, keep in mind, so let's see, we want to know where is the sine of 2x less than or equal to the cosine of x. So that's so where the blue curve, that's my sine of 2x, where it's below the red curve, which is the cosine x, that's where we should be seeing true. And notice that's where we've got that, those ones. Where the blue graph is above the red graph, we're getting a zero value for our inequality. So it's just kind of confirming. This is another way I know you actually plotted the difference of the two functions. This right. is a way of pulling them kind of both together there. Um, and I notice, I think that this has nice, uh, the, the tick marks on the axis are at multiples of pi over two. We could refine that a little bit by going down to X scale and just putting in, uh, I think, pi over six. All of your uh, important values were at multiples of pi over six. So mm -hmm. enter that and graph again. All those crossing points now are at that nice hash mark. That's value. your tick marks there. Yeah. Yeah, the tick marks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, Tom, cool. do one more thing. Change the um. Go to your window, and sure. let's just do that interval from zero to two pi, so that that those ah, three okay. intervals are very clear. Nice. But then two pi, and notice that you can just actually use those symbols, the, the two pi, and it'll then calculate the decimal equivalent. And now we'll graph that again. Ah, nice. So this is over. Very good. There they are. The other cool. thing that, I mean, you could also just utilize, and I, I don't know whether it's worth showing here, but if you utilize that trace, uh, key, you can trace to those pi over six um, characters now. If you just um, start, you can type in that pi over six value um, and see. 
and then use the up and up arrow keys um, multiples of pi over six and be able to see um, the places where it switches sign. So the up arrow key will go by uh, tick mark? Go by function. Mm -hmm. Oh, go by right. Yeah. You'll cycle through those and be able to right. see the one and the zero or, you know, this one's greater, cosine's yeah. greater than 2x, whatever. Yeah, and I, I kind of like this. This is in some ways, uh, uh, I like the incorporation of both the actual graphs and the truth plot. That's what I call this one zero plot. Because you just, it actually kind of highlights the really important intervals, uh, intervals, I should say, not intervals, intervals, and why they make sense. So. It's exactly where those those two graphs are changing y value position relative to each other. So very nice. Okay. Well, I will uh, unless there are comments, I'll stop the share and turn it back over to Steve. All righty, here we go. All right, Curtis, as usual, I've got another good question for you on this one. We didn't hear anything on the cosine division, but here's one for you. Oh, I put something in the chat about cosine division and okay. the zero, pro zero products and being able to factor rather than uh, having that one over there would not have been very useful. Okay. All right. Here we go. This one's a little bit more complicated. Sorry, I didn't say anything to you, Steve. I wanted somebody else to put it in the chat, but nobody did. So. Okay. All right. Uh, let's switch to oh. theta here for a little variety. Actually, let's... Steve, may I? Yes, may I sure. Well, there was another issue there that I don't know how much it came out was that if you divide both sides of an inequality by a negative number, right, you've got to switch the the order of the inequality. Yep. And cosine x, we really don't know. You kind of have to do that in two. Do right. You assume that it's positive and work that case out, and then assume that it's a negative and work that case out. So finding yeah. exactly there's what another that. problem with that. <laughs> All right, I'll shut up. Yeah. Boy, there's a lot of problems with that. Tom, you're coming up with all kinds of problems. All right, well, here's a problem. Let's see if we can find those values of theta between 0 and pi so that both of these inequalities are true. Yikes. All right, well, let's see what happens here. I'm going to work with first this inequality. And I'm going to do the usual here. I'm going to isolate a trig function on the left-hand side, a constant over here on the right. And I've got to find those values, what arguments satisfy this inequality. I'm thinking a little bit about my unit circle again. There it is on the right-hand side. And I think, let's see, it's going to be between pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. Okay. So let's see. I've got the sandwich theta. So I divided everything by two there. So there's an inequality for theta that satisfies this very first, well, inequality. Curtis, here's the second question for you, or here's a question for you. Okay. You know, in the other two problems, I actually took a look at other, what I might call starting inequalities like this. And I found those other inequalities by taking the endpoints and adding two pi. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that here. And I wonder why. We'll leave that as a question. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't do that. Did I leave that out for some reason? That's a good question. Let's take a look at this other inequality. All right, well, that one isn't too bad. That one, I'm just going to divide both sides by two. Where is the cosine greater than a yeah. half? And that's not so bad. I can just think about that, and I've got zero, or pardon me, theta between zero and pi over three. And so how do I answer this question? Does it end up here? Find the values of theta so that both of those inequalities are true. And so what I really need to do is to consider both of these inequalities for theta and find the intersection. And if I've done everything correctly, there's the intersection. And now, of course, I want to check this graphically. So here's what I did. I did this a little bit differently. And Tom may have a, I'm sure he has a snappy way to do this one. I graphed two times the cosine of theta. And I graphed two times the sine of 2x. And I graphed the line, this one right here. I'm sorry I didn't put a label in here, but this is the graph of y equal 1. 
And so I kind of looked at these two graphs and said, well, where are both of them? When are both of them? Where are both of them greater than one? Well, here's a spot right here. Here's a spot right there where they are. Both, both of those graphs are above that line, that horizontal line, y equal one. And yes, I've cheated a little bit. I put a couple of extra tick marks in there, but they are indeed at pi over 12 and pi over three. And I feel pretty good about this analytical solution. I think that's the right answer. You can take a look to the Steve, right. Steve, we did have somebody uh, come come back with, uh, you know, you've restricted the domain here. So, yeah. so uh, those uh, no need to go plus two pi k. Well, that 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 is true in the in the big sense here, but but I didn't see that right away. Let me show you what I did, Curtis, while we're here. Okay. Okay. So I actually thought about this and help me here. Don't let me make a mistake on this one. Okay. So let's see. If I add two pi to this, that's really adding what twelve pi over six. So that's really what uh, thirteen pi over six. Right. And that would be less than or equal to two theta which would be less than or equal to, let's see, what's that going to be? 17 over 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 17 over 6. Mm -hmm. So to follow the same style of solution here, now what I would need to do is divide both sides by 2. So I'm going to do that. Right. 13 pi over 12, less than or equal to theta, less than or equal to, what was that? 17 pi over 12. Over 12. Now mm -hmm. for me, Curtis, for me, looking at this inequality, I know I don't need to worry about that because 13 pi over 12 is just a little bit bigger than pi, and that's outside my interval right here. I don't need to worry about that. But we would need to worry about it if you changed your um, domain, your restricted right. interval over which you wanted your solutions. So right. It's a very important part of answering these questions is taking note of that restriction, zero to pi only, instead of zero to two pi. I mean, some sometimes you're careless in reading a question, students, even teachers, um, <laughs> and just make this assumption. Oh, you know, we ask everything else from zero to two pi. This one probably is too. So it's important to make note of what that domain restriction is. Very good. Tom, shall I do one identity? And uh, maybe you have something on technology with identities? Or no? Sorry, can't hear you on that one. Sure, go ahead, Steve. Okay. Curtis, I think we have time for one more problem here. So let's take a look at number four. Let's switch just a little bit and take a look at a couple of, well, quote unquote, trigonometric identities. You know, I think back to when I learned trigonometry, which was a couple of years ago, and I remember that these were some of my favorite problems. I don't know why. But taking some of these what look like complicated trigonometric expressions and try to simplify them. It just required, I think, a lot of good problem-solving skills, a lot of good trigonometric vision. I, I really enjoyed these problems. So let's take a look at this first one. Let's see if we can take this expression right here and reduce that or rewrite the expression so that the cosine of x appears once and no other trigonometric functions are involved. Um, Vicki, let me ask you a question before I solve this one. Is that the style of the question that we might see, that students might see on the exam? Is that the way the wording might be? Yes. Uh, this is going to be, this is going to show up in FRQ 4, which is okay. what we consider the most traditional um, question about, and it will either be about logs, exponents, or trigonometry, so units 2 and 3, but they will be very, very specific about the, the kind of directions you have here. Rewrite it so that cosine appears only once. And so they at least have a goal. They know what yeah. they need to do. And hopefully they can achieve that goal. <laughs> okay. So they will, it's not, I don't want to call it a hint, but they will give you something to shoot for, right? They'll yes. Tell you, okay. A, a, okay. And also kind of, well, when do I stop? Okay. okay. Yeah, gotcha. Because gotcha. We could write this final solution a different way, but we don't sure. want to due to our directions. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Well, a problem solving strategy in this one, I have two fractions. It sort of makes sense to me to try to combine these fractions and write them with a common denominator. The common denominator in this case is the product of the two denominators, and that happens to produce a difference of squares. So this is kind of nice. You have to multiply the top and bottom in this first one here 
by one plus the sine of x, top and bottom here by one minus the sine of x. I apologize, Curtis, I think I perhaps skipped a little step here, but this is what I get for a uh, fraction uh, with the common denominator of one minus the sine of x times one plus the sine of x. Some good things happen here. The sine of x is cancel. I'm left with a two in the numerator. In the denominator, I have one minus the sine squared of x, and I remember my trig identity, perhaps uh, the most important, perhaps the most common. That's just the cosine squared of x. And I think that's my final answer here. I have rewritten this expression in terms of just the cosine of x and no other trig function. Terrific. Let's take a look at D and I'll turn it over to Tom for one last bit of uh, technology. Let me see if I can arrow up here just a little bit. Here we go. I think this is a tricky one, Curtis. It says rewrite this expression so that only the sine of x appears once and no other trigonometric function is involved. It took me a while to figure out what to do with this one. Three times the sine of x minus four times sine cubed of x. You know, I thought about factoring out a sine. I thought about and rewriting the sine with a, a one minus sine squared with one minus the cosine squared. It took me a little bit to try to figure out what to do with this. How did I finally get this one? Somewhere down the line, I've done enough of these problems. This is perhaps a lost skill on many of our students today. But somewhere down the line, I've done enough of these problems to remember that, you know what? These constants, three sine, four sine cubed, somehow appeared in a sign of a, of a sum of angles. Somewhere I remembered that. So here's what I tried. Don't let me make a mistake here. The first thing I did is I rewrote three sine of x. I split that as the sine of x plus two times the sine of x. So I coupled one of them and two of them over here on the right. This I also split up. Minus two sine cubed minus another two sine cubed. And now I'm going to try to sort of mesh these two together. I put one of these expressions over here with the sine. I put the other one over here with two times the sine. And now let's see what happens. Hmm. In this expression, I factored out a sine. In this expression, son of a gun, I factored out a two sine. Okay, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. This one's a little bit easier. I recognize this as an expression for the cosine of a double angle. So I'm looking good at the big picture here because I'm thinking about the sine of a sum of angles. I'm looking good here. Let's see. This is really, and I'm going to put in another step here, that's really the cosine squared, but I split it up. Why? Because that expression right there is the sine of 2x. Wow. So now putting all of this together, that's actually an expansion of the sine of the argument x plus 2x. And that just reduces to the sine of 3x. That's a really cool problem. That's a good one for tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Those students, for those students who weren't on tonight. I love it, Steve. I <laughs> love it because uh, you said something there that I think is is really important. That there's, you know, something there is an importance to seeing enough of these yep. to kind of recognize some strategies for uh, utilizing those those trig identities and being able to to uh, you know capitalize yep. on those to simplify these these types of problems. Yeah, I'll turn it over to Tom, and I'll, I'll stand on my soapbox just for a minute. You know, it's this problem-solving toolbox. Mm -hmm. you know, how, do we, how do we generally go about solving a problem? We think about something similar that we did, and we try to get it back to that, something similar that we knew how to solve. Right. And, you know, students used to come into my office all the time and say, well, how do I study for this exam? And I'd say, you know what, do a bazillion problems. You know, because that just builds up this problem-solving toolbox. You know, how does an athlete get really good? 
They practice, practice, practice. Yep. Tom, a little technology to end this evening? Yeah, I think so. Let's give okay. it a shot. And I know we're running out of time, so I'll be quick on this. But uh, just, I think, you know, with graphing calculators, it's just a wonderful environment in order to uh, check out trig identities by using graphing as a kind of a check or confirmation. Um, and the y equals here, I uh, went ahead and took the liberty of uh, y1. I put in the expression Steve started with on part A, that 1 over 1 minus sine x plus 1 over the quantity minus sine x. And in y2, I put what he ended up with, that expression involving only the cosine. And I'm just going to graph both of them in a zoom trig window and see what they look like. So here's that one that involved the sine functions. And here comes the one involving it. And so perfect overlay match looks great. All right. Now I'm going to just do a little bit with part B. And I, I think we may have had a little dialogue with Vicki on this that we ended up doing this the same way. So I'm going to uh, turn off Y1 and Y2. And in Y3 and Y4, I have both of the expressions that uh, Steve started with and ended with. Uh, but I'm just going to graph Y3 for now. So let me enter that. Mm -hmm. Graph that. And in fact, I'm going to go over to the window and just do a 0 to 2 pi for my... Uh, uh, X min, X max. Gotcha. And graph it. And, you know, this is what I did when I first approached this problem. See, if I just <laughs> graphed the first thing. When I looked at it, I thought, well, shoot, there's <laughs> you know, too high. There's exactly three cycles. And so yep. this is just, uh, it's got to be sine 3x. So. <laughs> And of course, you can confirm it by graphing that over again. But it, uh, uh, it was kind of a reverse engineering. But I, I don't think that's a bad problem solving. It, it, you can actually look at that first expression and realize it's got to be periodic because it's involving sine, and those values will have to read at least every two pi. I mean, yeah, they actually are right. more often than that, but. It, it, a zero to two pi, we should be able to spot if it is periodic, what the period is. It should be within that. So. I think that is a worthy, I think that is a worthy uh, thing to, to note uh, is recognizing that you, it had to be periodic on zero to two pi. It may only be zero to two pi, but it had to be periodic on that. Mm -hmm. I think that was worthy of uh, recognizing. Cool strategy, Tom. Very good. All right. I'll cool stop. strategy. Curtis, we'll post these problems to answers tomorrow. There are a couple of other problems that we have solutions for, and we have an added overtime problem that will be there tomorrow, too. Okay? Fabulous. Uh, we'll okay. make sure to add those uh, on the uh, the YouTube uh, description for this video, this, uh, this live session. So we'll make sure to add those in the description for that. The, I know uh, oftentimes that gets lost and, you know, when people are looking. So when you go to YouTube and you look at this live description, make sure you click that little show more or the more button there. And you can see the remainder of the description. And that's where we'll have the links uh, to both the student document and the teacher document with the solutions and the extra overtime problems. I'm putting my chat or sorry, my um, email address in the chat here so that uh, you can Go and go ahead and email me for a professional development hour certificate. Uh, I'll send you a link uh, for that. And Karen Camp made one comment uh, there just at the end about utilizing the horizontal fraction bar uh, in your templates and, and things. Uh, that, that is a very helpful uh, tool when you're writing some of these out and, and using uh, these uh, the graphing calculator in particular for making those graphs. So uh, yeah, very helpful. Yeah, very helpful. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, let you guys uh, sign off here for this evening. We'll end the session. So uh, 
Thank you very much, Steve. You got a comment about the uh, pickleball background uh, <laughs> there. So <laughs> I will be on that court tomorrow morning at seven. <laughs> at seven a.m. All right. Well, with that we'll uh, we'll end the session. We'll see you guys here in about a month. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 All right, guys. We are.